Uh, I'm going to present today, actually, this is a, uh, a repurposed talk that I gave at uh, New Brunswick Heart Symposium in 2018. Uh, it's around complicated pericarditis, um, uh, defining and detecting the abnormal pericardium. So it's a very focused sort of pericardial talk um, with regards to echocardiography, a little bit of clinical cardiology, and a bit of multimodality uh, imaging, which uh, I, I, will, I will disclose I'm not an expert in, um, in, in advanced cardiac imaging like CT or CMR, but I do know some of the facets. And um, if Kim Conley's on the line, maybe he can add a few things uh, when we get to that section. I don't have any disclosures. So the objectives um, are to review the role of echocardiography in complicated acute and chronic pericarditis, and to discuss the role of multimodality imaging in these cases, including some image-guided therapies. So just a, a, a bit of clinical background to start off with, uh, um, just a reminder uh, in terms of the diagnostic criteria for acute pericarditis, which we do see relatively commonly. More recently, it's been, it's been more in, in the context of, uh, of uh, receiving a COVID-19 mRNA vaccine. Uh, when we get cases of myocarditis and pericarditis and myopericarditis, acute pericarditis remains largely a clinical diagnosis. And it, it, in order to be, um, I guess, confident in your diagnosis, you really want to have at least two out of the four criteria shown, shown on this slide. Um, Ideally, four to four would be great, uh, but uh, a lot of times we only have uh, two out of the four. Um, so the, 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 the four um, criteria are pleuritic chest pain um, that usually is typically worse when supine, uh, better when sitting up. Um, it's one of the characteristic aspects of this pain. The other type of pain uh, for clinicians uh, in terms of this particular um, characteristic is uh, that is uh, pain that's worse supine, better sitting up is pancreatitis. Um, you can have typical ECG changes, which are typically SC segment elevation. And we talk about the shape of that SC segment elevation as being concave up, um, so kind of more scooped out as opposed to concave down or more cove shape, which tends to be a bit more um, SC segment elevation, myocardial infarction. Uh, and then and you can see uh, concomitantly uh, PR segment depression. And the combination of the two really increases your confidence that this is uh, 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 acute pericarditis. The other thing about the ST elevation, as, as many clinicians know, is that it, it's usually fairly diffuse, uh, multiple leads crossing multiple um, coronary territories. Um, you can have actually um, localized pericarditis where it tends to be a bit more regional and that it gets to be a bit confusing with regards to uh, ST segment elevation, myocardial infarction versus acute pericarditis. And um, you know, when, I, when I'm on the ward, I tell the, 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 the PGY1s and trainees that I remember when I was a cardiology resident many, many moons ago that uh, uh, the, uh, my mentors, people like uh, 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 Luigi Casella, uh, Randy Watson, uh, would say that if you have ST segment elevation, especially with concave up, in leads one and leads two, then think about acute pericarditis because it'd be unusual to have uh, an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction involved in both the inferior leads and the high lateral leads. Pericardial friction rub is probably the least common of the four um, criteria, uh, and it's, it's also <laughs> difficult to hear uh, uh, um, at times. When you do hear it, it it's actually quite uh, remarkable. And then a pericardial effusion that is more than trace or physiologic. Um, and that's one of the reasons why echocardiography is, is commonly ordered uh, for, these, um, for these potential diagnoses. You can have other supporting findings, including elevated inflammatory markers like ESR and CRP. And as well, you can have other imaging evidence of pericardial inflammation by CT and by CMR, but you probably wouldn't want to order these on a routine basis for simple pericarditis. And the role of echocardiography in patients with acute pericarditis is to support the diagnosis is one of the, the, the diagnostic criteria of having a, a trace or a small pericardial effusion. But sometimes uh, it can actually be larger and it can be hemodynamically significant as well. Um, uh, having said that, many of the cases that we scan for acute pericarditis tend to have no pericardial effusion, or if they do, it's, it's in the realm of uh, a physiologic pericardial effusion. 
that is usually there anyways. You want to make sure that there are no hemodynamic effects, so we'll look for signs of tamponade physiology on echocardiography, which I'm going to discuss a little bit, but not get into a lot of detail. I really want to make this kind of more focused and case-based, um, but it's actually rare that you have acute pericarditis and present with tamponade. You want to assess for other, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, acute pericarditis is, is fairly benign. It's either idiopathic or viral, um, uh, um, uh, and uh, but you do want to assess for the few cases where uh, there are there is a serious or significant underlying uh, pathology that causes that presentation for acute pericarditis, such as myopericarditis. I mentioned COVID-19 mRNA vaccines. Um, uh, uh, also, uh, post myocardial infarction, somebody could have a missed MI present with with Dressler syndrome uh, and uh, pericarditis associated with recent MI, uh, and then type A aortic dissection uh, is uh, one of the Probably the, the uh, a relatively rare, but uh, but of, of course a, 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 um, a high risk setting where you you can present with pericarditis because of a dissection that uh, dissects down um, uh, uh, to uh, to uh, involve the pericardium uh, and, uh, and the aortic root. Um, oftentimes, as I mentioned, the echo is completely normal, no significant pericardial effusion, uh, and most patients with acute pericarditis will have a limited and uncomplicated illness. Uh, and echocardiography is really the first and, first and only imaging modality, uh, imaging test necessary. So I'm going to show three cases uh, through this talk. This is case one uh, of a 38-year-old woman uh, who um, I actually ended up taking care of um, uh, eventually. Uh, she has a history of severe necrotizing pancreatitis, which is associated with uh, uh, alcohol uh, abuse syndrome. Uh, with a prolonged uh, intensive care uh, admission uh, with that pancreatitis requiring ventilator support. She had ERDS, uh, multiple laparotomies uh, for complications of her necrotizing pancreatitis. She had acute kidney injury, uh, was temporarily on dialysis, uh, and this was due to ATN. She was in hospital for months. And she presented um, uh, with a three-day history of, of classic pleuritic chest pain. Uh, and this is her uh, echocardiogram uh, shown on the left here. These are four views, uh, parasitical long axis, uh, 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 parasitical short axis, uh, top right, apical four chamber view on the bottom left, and the subcostal view on the, the bottom right. Uh, and you can see that overall left ventricular size and cell function is normal. Uh, you do see a trace or small uh, circumferential pericardial views. You can see it on most views. Uh, it's a little bit more... Um, pronounced, I guess, uh, posterior and inferior to the left ventricle, uh, partly because of gravity, of course. And just as a reminder, when, when we think about um, uh, detecting a, a significant and um, uh, more than physiologic pericardial effusion, you really want to see that effusion at end diastole. Um, and if you have a, a, a trace slash physiologic pericardial effusion, especially if, if you have hyperdynamic LV slug function, you can, you can see that a pericardial effusion in systole, uh, but it's going to disappear completely in diastole. It's the other reason why, why non-gated cardiac CT tends to overestimate the size of the pericardial effusion because, because of the non-gated uh, measurements are, are made in systole uh, where it, it tends to overestimate the size of the effusion. But here you can actually see the effusion is, is small. You can see it in uh, end diastole in multiple views as possible. Uh, and this, you know, depending on other factors, could fit with, with acute pericarditis. And here's her ECGs. Um, uh, so you know, this is a pretty classic ECG for acute pericarditis. You can see the diffuse ST segment elevation. It's a little bit concave up. Um, uh, you can see it in V4 to V6. You can see it in V2. You can see it in V1. Uh, you can see it in V3 and AVF. Yeah, so fairly diffuse. And as I mentioned before, you know, ST elevation leads one and lead two. Think about acute pericarditis. You can see classic. PR segment depression, that's just a really nice example of uh, So, you know, it has three out of the four diagnostic criteria for acute pericarditis. So she was treated with, appropriately with the high-dose uh, NSAIDs, ibuprofen, uh, as well as colchicine um, with symptom resolution that she was discharged home, and she was eventually discharged home, but prior to discharge, she unfortunately developed acute tubular necrosis, um, uh, likely related to her ibuprofen. Kratin uh, triple from 51 to 147, and uh, she couldn't complete a course of NSAIDs, unfortunately. And, and she was she had resolved her symptoms by that time, and the, the team thought 
um, they would just try and manage her with, with cortisone uh, uh, and bring her back for follow-up. So unfortunately, she represented about a week later with her current chest pain, very similar to her uh, initial presentation. And here's, uh, here's her echocardiogram, which uh, has uh, obviously changed significantly uh, since, uh, since the, the first one. The effusion is significantly larger. So now we're in the realm of a, a good size, moderate circumferential pericardial effusion. You can see it a little bit more um, posteriorly, but definitely in the PVR VOT. You can see it here along the effects of the lateral wall and ventricle. Um, and of course, we're looking for signs of tamponade physiology, both clinically and echocardiographically. You can see the synopsis of the rest, the rest barometer on appropriately. Um, and then at least on these two views, uh, you don't see any signs of RV compression. Uh, and the, the difficulty to the RA, we don't see any RA inversion here. Of course, you do the Doppler, the IVC, et cetera, as well. Um, and, and at that time, uh, she had uh, elevated uh, biomarkers <clears throat> for inflammation. She had an ESR of 80, CRP of 146.5. And because she had the, um, the uh, ATM, uh, her NSAIDs, uh, she was started on prednisone. Uh, with uh, so the dose for uh, acute pericarditis is 5 milligrams per kilogram per day, and she did this daily, uh, and then a very slow taper uh, after that. And this is her uh, echocardiogram uh, eight weeks after uh, uh, completion of uh, of steroid taper, uh, and you can see that there's complete and full resolution of that circumferential pericardial effusion. Uh, and the echo is otherwise normal, and uh, she's done well over time. I don't, I don't think she's had any pain pericarditis. So, just some terminology when we thought when we when we think about pericarditis, that's that's kind of beyond a uh, 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 simple, uh, so complicated pericarditis. Incessant pericarditis is um, uh, defined as pericarditis that persists for four to six weeks. Uh, recurrent pericarditis is a uh, relapse uh, after being symptom-free for four to six weeks. Uh, uh, after an acute episode, after an episode of acute pericarditis, the probability of developing either incessant or having recurrent pericarditis in the literature is thought to be about 50 to 30 uh, percent. And additional recurrences occurs in 25 to 50 percent of patients um, if you do have that first recurrence. Um, and uh, further exacerbations beyond that are felt to be in that 20 to 40 percent range. Uh, chronic pericarditis is the presence of this for more than three months. And just in terms of what are the risks uh, for uh, um, uh, a recurrence uh, uh, of, of pericarditis, uh, well, there are uh, treatment related variables uh, that increase that do increase risk in multivariable models. Use of corticosteroids has been shown to be um, uh, a variable associated with uh, risk of recurrence. So one of the reasons why we, we try our best not to use uh, steroids unless absolutely necessary, particularly on the first um, uh, um, episode of, uh, of pericarditis. And lack of cortisone use, and, and, and many of you know about the clinical trials that have shown that cortisone uh, use uh, uh, should to reduce the risk of recurrent pericarditis. Um, uh, and we, use it, we tend to use it quite commonly. Um, there are some patient-related variables that uh, are associated with an increased risk in multivariable models. Uh, uh, any complete uh, response to model anti-inflammatory agents uh, and uh, uh, really a high level at the acute uh, episode. So a high CRP has been associated with, uh, with, with an increased risk of recurrence. The, the variables with, that are not associated with increased risk is a younger age, so doesn't matter what your age is, uh, male versus female, no difference, and it, whether or not you have a pericardial effusion or not with the first uh, episode of pericarditis, uh, not been shown to increase the risk uh, for uh, pericarditis. Um, so in complicated pericarditis, the rule of echocardiography extends a little bit. You want to assess the size of that pericardial effusion. You want to see if there's resolution after treatment. Does it persist? Is there an increase? Obviously, look for signs of temperature physiology. Um, as, as, it, as you get recurrent pericarditis or uh, incessant pericarditis, you want to assess for the presence or absence of constrictive physiology so that that, that inflammation can cause uh, uh, constrictive physiology and, and the signs of heart failure. 
Um, echocardiography, as, as we all know, has a very limited value for assessing pericardial thickness and size of inflammation. We do have some uh, less specific signs that that, uh, that that we could weigh on a little bit. Sometimes there's echogenicity within that pericardial space. You get the sense of some thickening uh, and uh, a, a boggy, infl inflamed pericardium, and the, uh, the, the presence of fibrinous strands within the the, the pericardial space uh, suggests a more complicated diffusion and maybe uh, more likelihood to, to go towards constrictive physiology. But these are definitely less possibilities. Uh, this is a nice uh, a little uh, a diagram from uh, Paul Kramer uh, and Alan Klein, uh, published as a uh, review in uh, the Journal of American College of Cardiology in 2016, with regards to the role of, of imaging uh, in, in various types of pericarditis. Um, and as you follow along uh, with acute pericarditis, for imaging, echocardiography tends to be the mainstay, as I mentioned before, for pericardial effusion, myocardial involvement, constrictive physiology. Uh, first recurrence, uh, echocardiogram uh, for constrictive physiology, CMR, uh, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging in select cases for inflammation or constriction. Uh, multiple occurrences, the same as this. Uh, and in constrictive pericarditis at the very end here, uh, you could add CT for extent of calcification and uh, preoperative uh, planning. The therapeutic aspects are shown uh, in the bottom. I'm going to get uh, into too much detail because I'm talking really on uh, echo and the imaging. NSAIDs and colchicine are the main things of three months of food, as you know, for, to prevent recurrent pericarditis uh, for the acute first episode of acute pericarditis. Uh, we usually tend to continue to use NSAIDs and colchicine again for fourth recurrence. But if you have a second recurrence and you're getting a realm of multiple recurrences, then of course you have to think about things like prednisone to consider uh, steroids uh, agents, but they really aren't uh, really good randomized controlled trials to show efficacy. Um, the first steroid dependent uh, recurrence pericarditis, then you definitely have to think about steroid sparing uh, agents and then consider pericardiectomy, which is really one of the last ditch resorts for. Um, uh, you know, uh, multiple recurrent uh, uh, acute pericarditis. Uh, uh, constrictive pericarditis, as we know, is 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 is, is typically uh, if um, if uh, the the patient is a, a candidate for open heart surgery, uh, is a surgical uh, disease, uh, and uh, there's really no role for medical therapy other than management of 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 of, of heart failure, which tends to be more right-sided heart failure. Okay, so here's a second case. Uh, it's a 34-year-old man uh, who was uh, admitted to CICU with a four-day history of uh, uh, a pleuric chest pain after all instead of flu-like symptoms, uh, found to be hypotensive in the emergency department. Uh, he had a moderate to large uh, circumferential pericardial effusion, tamponade physiology, uh, and he had tamponade clinically as well, and he underwent uh, pericardiosynthesis, and then he was treated with high-dose aspirin and colchicine. Uh, and his ECG is shown here on the left uh, uh, when he represents uh, four days. Uh, so he was treated for about uh, four to five weeks, uh, stopped his high dose ASA four days after he started having uh, a pleuritic chest pain again. And that was positional, fairly classic for acute pericarditis. He has his ECG on the left uh, showing um, some findings of acute pericarditis with diffuse S segment elevation, maybe not as striking as the the first case I showed you, uh, maybe very, very subtle PR segment depression, uh, but this uh, this SD elevation really is, is is fairly subtle. But you know, based at, with the with the current clinical history, I think most of us would call acute pericarditis. Uh, here's his echocardiogram uh, with the uh, with the second recurrence, with the, sorry the first recurrence, second time come back to hospital. You can see that there's a, at least a moderate pericardial effusion. It's a little bit more anteriorly than than posteriorly. Uh, and uh, if you notice, actually, there's this indentation of the RVOT. As the RV contracts, it tends to stay down into diastole, maybe that little, that little dip here. Uh, and then it really, you can see it best here on the end mode shown on the right, where, uh, where uh, the QS complex marks the onset of systole. The RV uh, uh, wall comes in. And even in, in diastole, you can see that dip in the, in the RV. Uh, 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 downwards, uh, so this is diastolic uh, RV inversion, a sign of increased uh, intraperical pressure slash uh, tamponade physiology. You can also see the, uh, 
the pericardial fusion tracks uh, uh, underneath the left atrium, and there's a little bit of uh, left atrial inversion as well. The left ventricle is small and hyperdynamic. Here's the apical fortune of view. It's, uh, it's actually a, a lot larger apically and uh, over the RV free wall. So this is a, a large circumferential pericardial fusion. It's a little bit larger in other areas. You can see a hint of fibrinous strands um, uh, in, the, in the pericardial fusion here. It's not as large laterally as well. You don't really see any R inversion. You don't see any RV inversion here, at least on the uh, on the apical fortune of view. Uh, here's an mode of the IDC showing uh, a dilated IDC does not collapse with inspiration. Uh, so I, you know, I think overall there's signs of temporary physiology of this patient. Um, so uh, he was also treated with uh, with acute uh, with uh, with pericardiocentesis. Uh, a cortisone uh, was continued, and then this time with recurrence, uh, prednisone was started, uh, and uh, rheumatology was consulted. Uh, 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 just to see if there was a rheumatologic cause. I feel to mention the patient did have a history of Crohn's disease. Was the only other history that he that he had um, um, uh, of note. Um, unfortunately, he presented uh, uh, four months later with a two-day history of left shoulder pain, radiating to the mid back, worse than inspiration. So there's a pleuritic component. He had elevated uh, uh, biomarkers for uh, inflammation of CRP and ESR. Cortisone was continued. Uh, prednisone, which had been tapered off, was restarted uh, along with ibuprofen. As ECG is shown here on the left, uh, with um, you know probably some degree of S-segment elevation, at least in leads one and leads two, leads ABL as well. And here his echocardiogram with the second emission. It's only the third emission overall. Uh, second recurrence uh, of uh, pericarditis, uh, and here actually. Just really a trace pericardial effusion. You can see it uh, in full, uh, in, uh, below the infralateral wall, so posterior and left ventricle. You don't really see much air to it in the RV. You can see here are the short axis shown on the right as well. Uh, apical forward, apical two chamber view. Once again, low normal LV systolic function, ejection fraction probably 50 to 55 percent. And, uh, and uh, you know, you really don't see the pericardial effusion with these views. So the patient is going to a cardiac MRI, and these are just uh, short axis. Uh, uh, this is a short axis stack, uh, showing the superficial pericardial effusion, and uh, we had gallium contrast. Uh, uh, these are just um, uh, two chamber, four chamber, three chamber views, very similar to the echo views. Uh, the volumes are shown on the bottom left. LV and vessel volume index seventy mils per meter squared. LV ejection fraction 57%, RV ejection fraction 51%. With gadolinib enhancement, actually, this patient had fairly diffuse pericardial enhancement. You can see here with the three views, uh, the, the bright white signal within the pericardial space. Um, so diffuse pericardial enhancement, widespread pericardial thickening. Um, this is, the, the, the report had a small, a probable fibrinous pericardial effusion. No, C no MRI evidence of constrictive physiology, and the uh, the echo also did not show any evidence of constrictive physiology. Normal left ventricle exercise, assault function, no evidence of myocardial scar, no delayed enhancement within the myocardium. So with this, actually, the, the patient did consultation with rheumatology. Uh, Ibuprofen was started, and later prednisone and ibuprofen was uh, slowly tapered, uh, and cortisone was continued. In the end, this patient ended up having a total of six admissions for recurrent uh, pericarditis uh, in, uh, over a span of probably one and a half to two years. Uh, he's followed by one of our cardiologists. He's also followed by one of our rheumatologists. And eventually, they, they made a decision to start uh, anakinra. Uh, anakinra, uh, many of you uh, may know, is a, is a relatively new biologic. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually a, a recombinant. Uh, modified human interleukin-1 uh, or IL-1 receptor antagonist. So it's an immunologic uh, anti-inflammatory agent. Uh, and he's been on this for, for quite a while. No recurrences. Uh, and I think there's ongoing plans to try and slowly get him off of this uh, and see if he has any recurrences. He's, un he's unreasonable, at least from a, from a, a recurrent acute pericarditis standpoint. Uh, this is a table uh, from that review that I mentioned earlier. Uh, about the role of a CMR in complicated pericarditis with the different uh, methodologies uh, that I 
uh, illustrated a little bit with the last case. So you can look at pericardial thickness, usually on T1 or T2 weighted uh, fast bit equilibrages. You can get the extent of pericardial thickness um, uh, and uh, the, the, the resolution is, is good enough uh, that, uh, that you can at least uh, 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 determine if there's a mild to moderate or moderate the thickened pericardium. If you really want to get the best resolution for pericardial thickness, is really gated cardiac CT. Now, some patients will have constricted pericarditis with normal pericardial thickness, at least for the Mayo Clinic series, but it, it really is quite rare that you can have constricted pericarditis per se with a normal pericardial thickness. You look for pericardial edema with a T2 uh, uh, inversion recovery fast spin echo, uh, likely a fairly specific finding for acute pericarditis if you have pericardial edema. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to distinguish from a pericardial infusion. I showed you an example of late gadolinium enhancement for pericardial inflammation, uh, usually reflects increased vascularity, uh, and it's a good potential for ruling or ruling out acute pericarditis in equivocal cases. And then, of course, you get signs of constrictive physiology, similar to echocardiography, you get ventricular independence, that septal excursion uh, and that increases with inspiration, uh, that may be a specific finding for constrictive pericarditis, or at least constrictive physiology. I'm going to finish off with a third case. Uh, this is a 78-year-old patient, that's a patient of mine, who uh, presented with a four-month history of a dry cough, shortest breath on exertion, bilateral leg edema. Uh, and he came into the emergency department. His blood pressure was uh, on the low normal side. He was tachycardic, uh, no evidence of uh, pulses paradoxes, but his GVP was elevated. And you can see the ECG here on the right. So no S segment elevation, sinus tachycardia, no specific STT wave changes. And here's his echocardiogram, uh, parasitical uh, long axis on the left, uh, short axis on the right. You can see there's at least a moderate size pericardial effusion, once again, a little bit greater on the anterior side as compared to uh, inferior or posterior to the left ventricle. You can see the extends uh, laterally as well. Um, you can see the respirometer is on, appropriately so. Uh, left ventricular uh, size is uh, normal to small, hyperdynamic left ventricular systolic function. Uh, and um, uh, you actually, th there's a fairly subtle RV inversion. It, it comes in hyperdynamic RV, cell function. It comes in, it tends to stay in a little bit into early diastole and expands in late diastole, maybe with the atrial kick. Uh, here's the apical four, the uh, subcostal view showing a moderate to large superficial pericardial effusion. Um, Difficult to know if there's any R inversion. We know it's 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 fairly sensitive, maybe a little less specific. You don't see any RV inversion here. Uh, the patient is tachycardic, and I can tell you the IVC was dilated, and we know his GVP was elevated. Um, so there was certainly concerns of of, of uh, early tamponade physiology. Uh, oh, here's the IVC as I mentioned before. You can see it's dilated, non non collapsing with uh, with respiration. With regards to mitral mitral tricuspid flows, you can see actually the there wasn't significant uh, respirophasic variation in the e, e velocities across the tricuspid valve, the tricuspid inflow, uh, perhaps across the mitral as well. Uh, uh, this one certainly is a lot higher than some of these, and it's probably uh, greater than that uh, that uh, that uh, 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 25 or 30 percent, depending on whether you're looking for tamponade versus constriction. So, uh, because of uh, Concern about early tamponade physiology he was tachycardic, blood pressure was a little bit low. He did undergo pericardial synthesis. The other reason, uh, the other thought process behind uh, uh, doing the pericardial synthesis was in part for, uh, for uh, diagnostic purposes as well. Uh, though that does have limited use uh, as compared to something like pericardial biopsies, for example. Uh, and that showed a serous fluid. Uh, cultures were negative, uh, including uh, cultures for TB eventually. Uh, there was some inflammatory cells uh, found, uh, and there was a negative for uh, malignancy. And the provisional diagnosis was viral pericarditis, causing a, a, a moderate to large pericardial effusion with early tamponade physiology. And um, it was managed as such with cortisine and naproxen. Uh, and after pericardial synthesis, his dyspnea improved. In the, uh, uh, he was ambulating well, and, uh, and uh, he was sent home for a clinical follow-up. Um, unfortunately, he presented two months later on uh, 
uh, with uh, worsened shortness of breath. He presented with fairly uh, significant abdominal distension as well, uh, pedal edema all the way up to the thighs, uh, and a weight gain of about 20 kilograms from 84 to 101 kilograms. So you, you already have a sense of as to, as to, as to where this is this this case is headed, uh, and you can see the um, the parts of the long axis shown here on the left. Probably a trace of fusion uh, posteriorly or behind that infralateral wall. You get the sense that there's some increased equigenicity within that pericardial space uh, in, the, in the RVOT. You see the thickening of the aortic valve. Uh, there was a degree of aortic stenosis that was not severe, the small thickening of the, the mitral valve. Here's the apical four chamber view on the left and uh, and uh, 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 and this is mitral inflow uh, Doppler profile on the right. Um, and you can see um, that increased echogenicity within the, the pericardial space. And you know, this is a, it's still a bit of a short loop, but, but you, you wonder a bit about some abnormal septal motion. You need longer loops just to see if there's any ventricular interdependence. Uh, but you can see there's a significant respiratory variability variation in that. Mitral inflow. The other thing I'll point out is that um, that uh, if if you see a pericardial effusion, uh, or even with a with a with a normal a heart with a, a, a physiologic effusion, uh, normally you have this sort of sliding motion of the of the myocardium uh, 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 with the with the with the with the prior pericardium, and here you don't see it. It almost looks a little bit Fix. It's a little bit of a subtle finding where you don't have that typical sliding motion. It's a, it's, it's a sign of, uh, of, of, of constriction, uh, or at least a sign of inflammation to the point where you don't have that sliding motion because of the inflamed uh, pericardial, uh, uh, pericardial. Uh, and actually, if you go back, uh, oops, go back and look at it here. Once again, you, you, you kind of lose that sliding motion as the RVOT contracts as well. So something useful to look at. It's a bit of a subtle finding, but can be fairly specific. Um, here's that long loop that I, that I mentioned uh, earlier. A bit of a difficult image, but uh, you want to know to see if there's any ventricular independence. And uh, if, I, if I look at the septum here, you can see every now and then the septum shifts from the right to the left. RV expands a little bit compared to the LV. LV gets a little bit smaller. Uh, and this is fairly subtle ventricular interdependence, a sign of uh, constrictive physiology. Uh, Subcostal view. You see once again that echogenicity within the pericardial space, the IVC dilated doesn't collapse. And the patient had a, a, a gated cardiac CT that showed a, a, a moderate circumferential pericardial effusion, no evidence of malignancy, bilateral or plural effusions. You see the pericardial effusion around here. And uh, uh, there was actually no evidence for pericardial calcification, but there was a thickening of the pericardium with an enhancement of the pericardium. The patient had very mildly elevated uh, biomarkers for inflammation in ESR and CRP. And the pericardial fluid uh, showed increased intensity, uh, signal higher, output is higher than water, uh, and uh, met criteria for a quote unquote complex uh, pericardial fusion. Uh, the patient underwent uh, uh, cardiac catheterization, uh, minimal CAD for the coronary arteries. You can see the pressure is shown here. Uh, LVDP was 19 millimeters mercury, so elevated. Uh, uh, RVDP was 18 millimeters mercury. RA pressure showed an A wave up to 31. V wave of 18, mean of 17 millimeters mercury. And the mean um, uh, 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 left atrial pressure was 18 millimeters mercury. So you had relative equalization of the of, of all four all four chambers of the heart, both left and, and right side, uh, and this uh, met uh, criteria for uh, constrictive uh, physiology. Uh, as well, the 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 team did simultaneous LV and RV pressure assessments that showed a possible ventricular independence, but they weren't uh, completely convinced. Um, but some of the recordings showed inspiration would increase the RV systolic pressure with a decrease in the, in the wedge pressure and the LV cell pressure. So you know, overall, there was uh, hemodynamic uh, uh, evidence for uh, uh, constriction and certainly did fit the, the, uh, the echocardiogram. 
so the patient was discussed at case notes and the decision was to offer the patient pericardiectomy. You could have considered uh, treating again for acute pericarditis. It was only much more complicated uh, compared to the initial presentation. Uh, and that was considered, uh, but in the end, the team thought that, uh, that uh, you know, there was, he had pretty, pretty a significant kind of refractory uh, rights in heart failure. It would have been an interesting uh, uh, trial of, of, of anti-inflammatory agents. Probably steroids would have to be used to see whether or not uh, things resolved completely. In the end, he went to surgery, and uh, uh, it was, uh, uh, the surgeon found that the whole pericardium was significantly thickened. Uh, there was a large amount of bloody uh, pericardial fluid under pressure, uh, and uh, there was a deposition of fibrin on the surface of the whole heart that was partially adherent to the pericardium. So there was some, definitely some degree of uh, constriction. The uh, pathology from uh, the surgical specimens uh, showed fibroadipose tissue with chronic inflammation, fibrosis, fibrin deposition at minimal uh, histologic signs of acute inflammation. So maybe maybe this would lead uh, more towards a, 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 a likely lack of response to acute inflammatory uh, therapies, but, but who knows? But the final diagnosis was uh, was a fecal constrictive pericarditis, and I've followed him uh, 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 since that time. It's about two years ago. He's actually done well over time. Actually, no recurrent um, uh, uh, pericarditis uh, and uh, no heart failure. Uh, so he's done quite well over time. He had he had a really long hospital stay. Um, okay, so these are the conclusions. Uh, I'm finishing a little bit early, chewing up. Uh, it's a bit of a shorter talk. Maybe not such a bad thing. So uh, in complicated pericarditis, I think you mentioned uh, for simple acute pericarditis, echocardiography really is the mainstay. But if you have recurrent episodes or more chronic pericarditis, then other imaging modalities such as uh, cardiac CT and CMR uh, are, are definitely useful. Uh, echo can determine the presence of the pericardial effusion. Look at hemodynamic effects, whether it's tamponade or constrictive physiology. Look at response to therapy. Look at any associated pathology. And as I said, it's the mainstay for simple or complicated pericarditis. CMR uh, has similar findings to echocardiography, but adds the ability to look at pericardial thickness, enhanced with inflammation, uh, edema within the pericardium. And then cardiac CT is probably the best resolution for thickening of the pericardium, the best technique for detection of calcification for chronic uh, constrictive pericarditis, which is the most likely pathology. Uh, some degree of pericardial enhancement as well, and some degree of constrictive physiology. And with that, I will stop Chibing, and I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you, Howard, for such a comprehensive uh, review of this uh, issue. It is one of the challenging things that we have to face as cardiologists, and I'm sure uh, all of us have some patients that have uh, some of these problems. And and uh, for the constriction, I find it like really hard to, um, you know, sometime initially detect because you have to have a high uh, index of suspicion. There are lots of patients who uh, may have this problem and been like, you know, underdiagnosed. Uh, and then uh, for patients uh, with pericarditis, I find it also challenging because uh, often no matter what you do, they keep coming back with uh, different episodes. And uh, we, we, we often end up, you know, uh, getting rheumatology involved and then, uh, using higher levels of anti-inflammatories and uh, drugs that we may not even have heard of to try to help them to, to try to prevent them from keep showing up in emergency or or to our office. So with that in mind, I have a question. So um, there are different ways of um, detecting the pericardial thickness or trying to figure out whether the patient has pericarditis or constriction. Uh, that's involved echo, which is quite difficult to look at the pericardium itself but we are able to figure out the physiology using echo. But how about CT versus MRI? Which one should we go first or should we do both? Yeah, so sometimes they are complementary and sometimes we do both. Um, I have to admit a lot of times we do both mostly uh, more, more so for academic reasons. Um, from a technical standpoint, if you're just looking purely at thickening and um, calcification, CT is probably better. We need to get guard, uh, gated cardiac CT, CT has a better resolution for picking up uh, a, a thickness of the pericardium as opposed to MRI. And I lean more towards CT for chronic constrictive pericarditis, uh, but for um, recurrent, uh, incessant, uh, more inflammatory acute pericarditis, I would lean more towards CMR. Uh, 
because there you get the added benefits of edema, inflammation, uh, delayed enhancement uh, aspects. Uh, but sometimes they are complementary. Very good. Any any other questions from our colleagues uh, who are online? Please uh, feel free to unmute. Dr. Leon Poy, did you find it um, that it was easy to get anakinra for the one patient in case two, or was it quite challenging? Um, yeah, it wasn't my wasn't my patient, uh, but uh, uh, I was reading through some of the notes through the rheumatology. Um, I I actually don't think it was difficult for them. It obviously, we're an academic center with a rheumatology. Um, the patient had been on other biologics for uh, their IBD, um, so I, I they, they've been on it for uh, probably over a year now. Okay, thank you. It is very Can you also comment on? Oh, go ahead. No, I'm not saying it, it, it is, I think the business point. It is. It is a very expensive agent, right? <laughs> Go ahead, Chimi. Oh, so my question is, um, how long should we keep people on cochicine after uh, an episode of uh, acute pericarditis or maybe uh, post-op prophylaxis? Uh, because there's sometimes it's three months, sometimes it's six months, sometimes it's shorter, sometimes it's longer. So. Yeah, the guidelines say three months. Um, <laughs> I think depending on the case and how difficult it is, sometimes I think many of us extend that. And I've actually extended up to over a year, especially for the really recurrent ones, um, partly for two reasons. One is colchicine is very cheap. Um, that's the first thing. And second thing, beyond the diarrhea, <laughs> uh, if you can tolerate it, there's it, it, very few side effects. I, if, uh, for, for complicated patients, uh, keeping them on a small dose of colchicine is not the end of the world, per se. Uh, but the minimum is three months. Any other questions? Howard, it's uh, Bob. Hi, Bob. Hi. Uh, just a, a you know minor point, but sometimes. Um, posteriorly, you'll see a space, and then the per, you know the brightness of the pericardium, and uh, you know it could be fluid, uh, but it could be sort of you know thickening. And in the old days, back to the old days here, if you put an M mode on that, what you could see with the M mode more clearly is that the the bright pericardium actually moves anteriorly with the ventricle in systole so that instead of you know so that telling you that this is this is really not fluid this is really um this is really uh effusive constrictive kind of um physiology so that it's just uh if there's fluid posteriorly then the bright echo the pericardium stays flat right and the and the uh, epicardium moves anteriorly with the space, but if the pericardium moves with the posterior uh, endocardium, then it gives you uh, this, the that this is uh, sort of more likely to be effusive constrictive. Okay, no, that's excellent. Thanks, Bob. Uh, 